event at the Wigtown Book Festival, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Fred Pierce, who is a highly acclaimed science writer, has been writing for many years, and has written many books in the environment correspondent of a new scientist, as well as writing for most of the world's leading publications. And don't, don't, don't push it too much. No, I, I've, I've been around. <laughs> he's, he's been around. I was just saying, I, I read an, a very early article. Uh, Fred was writing about climate change in the 1980s, so that's, uh, that he was ahead of the game. Anyway, without more ado, I'll let him explain, and he'll do a short presentation uh, of what he's, his book is about, A Trillion Trees. I can't recommend it highly enough as a, as a really unique and interesting new perspective on, on something you perhaps think you, know, you may know quite a lot about. OK, thank you. OK, I, I know we normally, um, at Wigtown, it's normally just a conversation, but I'm going I'm to give you a kind of 20-minute kind of summary of the points that I'm trying to make in, in the book. Um, and partly that way, I can, I can show, you, show you some pictures from my travels as well. Most of the pictures you'll see are uh, from, from my various reporting trips. Um, I'm interested in forests and trees because, well, we all are. Um, we love them, but we also kind of fear them. I mean, I go back to childhood and you probably have a sense of um, forests and trees being something slightly other, but, but, but part of us, but yet kind of alien. Sometimes we call them rainforests, that's good. Sometimes we call them jungles, that's kind of bad. Or we call them sacred groves or wild lands. Or, but they always, I think, fire our imaginations. So nursery rhymes are full of cautionary tales. So Little Red Riding Hood waylaid in the forest by a big bad wolf. It's Hansel and Gretel getting kidnapped by a cannibalistic forest witch. Rapunzel locked up in a tower in a wood. Even modern tales um, invoke the kind of mystery. So if you think about the Lord of the Rings, or Where the Wild Things Are, which is my favorite children's book, or The Blair White Witch Project even. All, they kind of play with forests and, and are thinking about forests. And most of the world's religions have trees as symbols of life. Uh, and none of this should surprise us, I don't think. As our greatest naturalist, one of my heroes, Richard Maybe, said, trees are just something else. He said they're capable of outliving not just individual humans, but whole civilizations. So, something special about trees. Um, so, my book is about our troubled, sometimes, relationship with forests and how to live better with them. How to, in the subtitle of the book, how to reforest our world. Uh, but it also is about slaying some myths and having a new look at forests. For instance, we like to think of forests as pristine wilderness. Um, but one big surprise is that almost all forests, anywhere you go, are marked by extensive human occupation. It's imprinted in their ecology. And that's not just in Europe, where you might expect it, but many of the biggest and apparently wildest um, forests, like this one um, in southern Guyana on the screen, are little more than overgrown gardens created by the ancestors of those who live in them today. And that includes the greatest, the most biodiverse of all the Amazon, where before Europeans showed up, large local populations built cities, did a lot of agriculture, remade the soils. Quite a lot of the soils in the Amazon are unlike anything that you would get naturally. They planted orchards over wide areas, constructed amazing earthworks. Now, it would be a stretch to say that the Amazon is human-made, but um, it isn't natural either. It's a kind of wild garden. 500 years of rewilding, if you like. Now, for decades, um, I've reported for New Scientist, as was mentioned, and other magazines and websites and so on, on the importance of trees. And they have a huge range of things that they do for us. They keep us cool. They preserve the planet species, of course. They maintain rainfall. They alleviate poverty for many communities. They protect indigenous peoples. And I've written two about who owns them and who uses them and who protects them, and frequently these days who destroys them, who trashes them. That's a picture taken, um, it's a scene of loggers at work. You can see the, they're playing games, actually. I mean, they're playing with their kit. 
But that was loggers in Sarawak, in Malaysia, in Borneo, an area that was entirely forested on my first visit in 1990, it was being subjected to intense deforestation on my second visit, which is late 1990s somewhere when this picture was taken, and is now almost entirely forestless today in Sarawak. It's covered in palm oil plantations. So I've seen that journey from, from apparently pristine rainforest to palm oil plantations, just one species. So this book, it's a, it's a journey, my journey, through the world's forests to orchid-filled cloud forests in the Ecuadorian Andes, uh, radioactive forests around Chernobyl in Ukraine, swamp forests in Indonesia, community forests in Nepal, I'll come back to community forests later, acid rain ravaged forests across Central Europe still, pine forests in the American Deep South that we're now bizarrely cutting down to keep the lights on in Britain by powering the Drax power station in Yorkshire. And I've been to sacred groves in India and West African forests whose logs uh, funded a civil war, and that is a logging road in, in Liberia. Um, so it charts the extraordinary pace of forest destruction. We all know about deforestation, which actually peaked in the 20th century um, and maybe started to decline now. It also explores where and how forests are recovering because they are in places. And the book looks forward to a great, what I believe will be a great forest restoration in the 21st century um, and how it can happen and why it must happen. So that's kind of what the book's about. Now, I'm, I mentioned deforestation. We hear a lot about it and quite right too. About half the world's forests have gone since the dawn of civilization. Three trillion trees lost mostly in the last half century. A trillion is a lot. Um, the sound of chainsaws has replaced birdsong from the steppes of Russia to the backwards of Australia of, and uh, here in Guyana, where as an artisan logger at, wor at work. Um, but all is not lost. Almost a third of the planet's land surface is still tree covered. That's a further three trillion trees. So we had six trillion, we're now down to three trillion. But that's a lot. That's more trees than all the stars in the Milky Way. And they're home to more than half the world's species. And they cleanse our air and our water and they deliver fruits and nuts and rubber and timber and honey and medicines. They do a lot of you know, natural forests, still functioning forests, do a lot of work for us. Um, and they store water. They've got ecological services, people talk about it now. They store water, they maintain river flows, they control floods, like here in a, a sacred grove uh, that I visited in Honduras in Central America. They control the climate too. My book explores some new science about how trees have literally made the environment in which they and we live. And this is not just about carbon. We hear a lot about carbon and global heating and how forests soak up carbon and, and moderate it. And that's pretty important. Trees store as much carbon as humans have emitted into the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So that, you know, that matters. But it is also about how forests make the rain. Each day, an average tree, those three trillion trees, pump around 50 liters of water each into the atmosphere from the quintillions of tiny pores, the stomata on their leaves. And that has, does a great deal to keep the atmosphere moist and create rain. And they chuck a lot of other stuff into the atmosphere. The chemical breath of forests um, helps make clouds, the cloud condensation nuclei that, that create clouds and rains. One of the most fascinating trips I did during my research was to climb a tower, a tower as tall as the Eiffel Tower, no lifts, you had to walk all the way up, in the Amazon outside Manaus, where German scientists had built this, uh, to catch and analyze the great rainforest's breath, to just kind of do the chemistry of what was happening up there above the forest canopy. 
And a lot of people engaged in this kind of work. I, also in Brazil, I met a playboy bush pilot, this guy, Gerard Moss, um, who teamed up with scientists to make flights that proved that the moisture from the Amazon forests coming off the canopy of the forest provides almost all of the water for what they call a flying river that makes rain for the world thousands of miles away. They wouldn't get any crops in Argentina without the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. And there are other things. I mean, I met two Russian physicists who believe that forests make the world's winds too. And that's still quite controversial, but the evidence looks really quite compelling that all this activity above the forest generates winds, especially inland. So it turns out that even without their carbon, forests are vital to our climate. No trees could mean no rain and maybe no wind either. So we have plenty of reasons to protect and to restore our forests. And the good news is that deforestation is not, as some believe, unstoppable. We can and are in places preventing it and reversing it. A little told story is that deforestation is probably slowing. The data are difficult, but probably slowing. And forest restoration certainly is accelerating. Worldwide, we have more trees now than we had a generation ago. Now, they're not all in natural forests or what you'd call natural forests, but there are more trees than we had a generation ago. Take Costa Rica in Central America. Now, for much of the 20th century, Costa Rica was a hotspot for deforestation. I remember writing about it. 3% of trees lost every year or something of that sort. Its rainforests were being ripped out, mainly to make cattle pasture for beef. In fact, at one point, 60% of the beef raised there was bought by Burger King alone. Um, and tree cover declined. It went from 75% in 1940 to 20% in the late 1980s. There's some stats showing. Um, but then his president in the 1980s got green fingers. He went to the Earth Summit. He, he started talking about in the environment. And he began paying ranchers to let forests regrow on their land. And his successors have carried on that. He said that it would reduce floods and encourage ecotourism, and it worked. Costa Rica, which is an unusual country in many ways, it doesn't have an army, it's, it has a sort of different approach to the world, but it works. Forests now, forests now once again cover more than half of Costa Rica, back up from 20% to above 50%. And ecotourism has worked too, it's worth about $2 billion, billion a year to their economy. And farmers, the old cattle ranchers, are now building lodges in the new rainforests that are growing on their old pastures. So visitors that go there, and lots of people from Britain go there, never know that the jungle that they admire at these lodges was until very recently a cattle ranch. I think that's brilliant. Um, it shows that nature can recover and that we can let it recover. So can the world repeat this trick with global reforestation. Now, I believe it can. For several years, there's been a growing campaign to restore a trillion trees, is the phrase, hence the title of my book, um, across the world. Fight climate change, to restore ecosystems, to halt species extinctions. Now, I buy that ambition. We do need a trillion more trees, and that's why I chose it for the title of my book. But and there's the title of the book again. But my only problem is with the word planting. Planting a trees would require a vast global industry. A trillion trees would require planting a thousand trees every second for the next 30 years, because a trillion is a big number. And it would require buying up land, taking over farms, land grabbing, taking former forest land and often riding roughshod over local rights. It would be hugely disruptive. Um, and it would be, I believe, and the research suggests, almost entirely unnecessary. For if we give her room, nature will mostly do it for us. And I have a chapter going through describing the research that underpins this, and it runs from 
anywhere from the Amazon to the Scottish Highlands to English Lowlands to the Russian steppes, wherever you go. Nature will usually do it better. For a start, because nature knows which trees to plant where, it'll produce much more resilient, um, adaptive forests. And it is already happening. Most of those trees that have grown in Costa Rica in the last couple of decades naturally regenerated. There is very little planting going on. And in Europe, Europe has a third more trees today than it had in 1900, and most of them were not planted. In fact, most of them have simply been trees recolonizing abandoned farmland. In Eastern Europe, after the collapse of collective farms and communism after 1990, a lot of farmland was abandoned. In Southern Europe, from Portugal to Italy to Greece, huge areas are being almost abandoned by people as populations get older and young people stay in the city. You, go, you can find almost empty villages. Um, and wherever this happens, the trees come back. Or, you know, there are other cases, industrial farmland and so on. In this case, this is a picture I took in the exclusion zone around the wrecked Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which you can, you're allowed to go into for a couple of days, but not longer, because it's still quite radioactive. But the trees don't seem to mind the radiation. Um, as long as people are absent, as long as people aren't taking the land that the trees want, the trees will move back in and take over. And often, too, Farmers are bringing trees back on to their land. This is a kind of global phenomenon, but you see it most spectacularly on the edge of the Sahara here. In Niger, one of the world's most arid, poorest, and hungriest countries in West Africa, also has one of the highest birth rates in the world. Millions of farmers have rejected the conventional advice from the government agriculturalists to clear bush before planting their crops. They used to do that every year before, before, uh, before putting the, 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 the maize or whatever it was in. Instead, they're now nurturing trees in their fields. They're letting the stumps in the ground grow. And they're being rewarded with richer soils, and better grain yields, and better fed families. Um, places once thought to be succumbing to the advancing Sahara are now, places like this are now greener, wetter, and cooler. There are about 200 million extra trees there. So these are places, you know, I'm, many of you will, like me, remember the days when we thought of uh, the Sahel on the edge of the Sahara as kind of turning to desert. The desert was advancing, it was taking over, taking farmland. Well, actually, something really very different is happening there now, and it's happening because farmers are nurturing a natural restoration of trees. That's a brilliantly good news story for me. So, I, and there are plenty of other examples. I believe the science is clear that natural tree restoration, whether in forests or on farms, is best. Research shows that naturally restored forests, not only do they will they happen, but they also hold more carbon uh, than planted forests in soils as well as in trees. They're also more resilient to wildfires and to changing climate conditions. You know, as climate change happens, the natural stuff will do better. Mostly, all we need to do is stand back and give nature room. Now, it's an issue, I know, giving nature room, but we can do it. Um, there is room, and I explain that again in the book. Um, and here's another surprise, to me at any rate. The science is also increasingly clear that the most successful forest restoration projects happen not in spite of the local people, but at their instigation and with their support. So indigenous communities and many other forest communities really valuable, value forests for what they provide. And if they have control over them, um, they will protect them and indeed they will restore them and grow them. So, you know, they're using them for all sorts of things, whether it's kind of climbing them to get coconuts, as here in Ghana, or, or, or what it is. Too often we think of forest dwellers as the enemies of forests. I certainly did. That's kind of, you know, the environmental thought is that people are taking over forests and people are bad for forests. They clear them to grow crops or raise livestock. And that, obviously, that happens some of the time. 
But most of the time, where communities have control over their trees, and that's important, and control over their forest land, so they know they can pass them on to the next generation rather than having somebody coming in and wreck it all, they are the forest's best defenders. So in the Amazon, indigenous reserves stand out as green bastions in an ocean of deforestation. If you look at a satellite image of where the forests are in the Amazon and you then mark on where the indigenous reserves are, that's a pretty good match. Across Africa and Southeast Asia also forests survive and regrow primarily on lands customarily controlled. They may not have legal title, but they're there and using the forests because they value them, because they're important resources, because they want them, and they have cultural ties to them and all sorts of things. And, you know, they do stuff like hunting. It's not as if they leave them alone. Um, and forest ecologists are getting wise to this, to the fact that community-controlled forests often hold more carbon, deliver more biodiversity, even the national parks because the local people are there and they're more committed to their forests than rangers employed by a government agency. One leading researcher on this told me, quote, we can increase carbon sequestration, putting carbon in the forests, we can increase carbon sequestration simply by transferring ownership of forests from governments to communities. And that's not a political statement, it's a robust statement of research findings. And some governments are getting this too. So Indonesia's social forestry program is a really big deal. It's transferred an area of forest the size of Denmark to almost a million householders because it believes that they will protect and restore those forests better. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, okay, its government structure may not be great, but it has some good policies. It's committed to community management as part of an effort to restore its logged forests and meet international commitments. And again, these are not going to be abandoned forests. These are communities will be able to exploit their forests. Um, they'll be cutting timber for local uses, such as furniture making here, really big use of, of, uh, um, of wood in rural areas, or just simply harvesting the fruit. Um, in the Congo, they're going to be agreed management plans. We'll see how they play out. But, you know, there's a sense that you know, deals can be done with local communities that will, in return for their having control over the forests, there will be protection going on. And my book is full of heroes who are making this happen in the real world. So one of the most famous is, um, some of you will remember the Kenyan Nobel Prize winner Wangari Maathai. Uh, her Green Belt movement organized women to plant an estimated 50 million trees in Kenya, on farms, in gardens, on roadsides, in schoolyards, outside public buildings, all across the country. Fab it was a fabulous movement. As I, I'm not against all planting, I just don't think it's the ultimate solution. And nor did she, because there is much more to her um, than her legacy in that planting. For a while, she was, that's just a piece of farmland in um, Kenya, but a very a lot of trees on that farmland. For a while, Wangari Maathai was Kenya's environment minister back about 15 years ago after Daniel Arap Moy uh, was removed from office. And during that time, she introduced a forest act that created dozens of democratically elected community forest associations. And these handed back control over local forests from the state, state agencies to local communities. And that included five of the forests that are famous there on mountainsides as being the country's water towers because they generate the rain that feeds the rivers and irrigates crops and so on. So important for the national economy. And they've been put in community hands. Now, for decades before that, um, that's just one of the community forests, for decades before that, corruption had allowed an escalation of deforestation in Kenya. Um, in state-controlled forests. But under community management, many have since recovered. Forests on the Abu Dhabi Mountains, one of the most important water towers, and now cover a fifth more area than they did in 2005. And that's mostly through natural regeneration, encouraged by local people 
who value their forests. People who value their forests like uh, Sarah uh, Karungari, um, who I met in Kimunye village near Mount Kenya. And she's showed me, and you can see there, her forest beehives in a small clearing in the, in the forest on the mountain. Now, in the old days, she told me, the government wardens who were in charge of the forest would have, she'd done that, would have torn down her hives, and they prosecuted her for invading the forests. But now, they encourage her to do this, um, and to use the forests in what they would call sustainable ways. And I spoke to a local warden who agreed. He said, people, these people who used to be poachers and illegal loggers are now defending the forests because they're their forests. And he added, farming communities know their ecosystems, including the forests, far better than outsiders. He was basically saying, I'm a forest warden, but these are the people that actually know about the forests and should be in charge of them. And there are many such stories in the book, including some much closer to, co closer to home. So I'll end by talking, coming back to Scotland. So this is... Well, in Scotland, the social movement for returning the great sheep grazing and grouse shooting and deer stalking estates to community control. Well, you know, you'll know it's a growing movement here, and it's also about planting and nurturing trees, reforesting Scotland, if you like. For wood, sure, for bringing in tourists and artists to nice forested areas, and for more generally rewilding nature. And this is the North Assind Estate near Loch Inver, one of the first uh, to be taken back from, the, uh, from big estates. Um, it was once a barren landscape, more or less of sheep pasture, owned by the Vesti family. And then the local crofters in the 1990s uh, took back control under a, a, you know, an innovative deal. Um, now, one of them, Bill Ritchie, I spoke to, and he boasted that it, this area is now, from being sheep pasture, is now possibly one of the most biodiverse spots for hundreds of miles, he reckoned. And all his, he and his neighbours did was clear out the sheep and watch the forests return. He told me, we planted some oak and ash and a few wild cherry trees, but this is 99% natural regeneration. I want to leave the land to do its own thing, he told me. Now, that's kind of my idea of what rewilding should be about. And so it has. This corner of Scotland is now, by some measures at any rate, one of the largest areas of landscape restoration in the whole of Europe. It's a really important um, piece of rewilding, but also re-community, retaking of control by communities over land and forests. So I'm going, to, I'm going to stop there, but one last thought. Um, I've been writing, and this may be come up in the conversation, I've been writing about the world's environmental problems now for 40 years for various places um, in books and magazines. So I've written about toxic tips and the ozone layer, remember that, in the 1980s. I've written about deforestation for a long period, about the emptying of the oceans. I've written about urban smogs and the health crisis created by them and species extinction and climate change and spreading deserts and acid rain and all sorts of stuff. It's not an edifying story. Um, it's scary. But despite it all, honestly, I remain an optimist. For the world can turn. Yes, we've done a lot of damage in the 20th century. My gut feeling is that in the 21st century, we're going to start repairing some of that for a whole range of reasons, including climate change. And the really good news is that nature is not so fragile. The forests can regrow. Nature will restore itself. It's done it before, and it'll do it again. Maybe we're vulnerable to climate change, but nature will probably get by. And in most places, to restore the world's forests, we need to do just two things. We need to ensure that ownership of the world's forests is vested in the people who live in them, and we need to give nature room. Those are just the two things that I have in my head, and half the book is just discussing those. So the subtitle of my book, as you can see, maybe you can see, is How We Can Reforest the World, Reforest Our World. Now, my American publishers want to change that a little bit. They're going to have the subtitle as Restoring Our Forests by Trusting in Nature. And that's right. I would only add one thing. We should also trust in forest communities 
Because in a crowded world, only they can do it. And perhaps most importantly, only they really have the incentive and the need and the desire to restore the planet. So I believe we will restore forests in the 21st century, and I believe it will be the local people who are often demonized about deforestation. It will be the local people who do it. So that, I really am stopping that. Thank you. Sorry, I, it became 30 minutes. I no, apologize. no, it was wonderful. It was really fascinating. And as I said, unusual to have a, an optimistic take rather than the, you know, the, the constant... I try very pessimism. hard, but I mean, it is, it is genuine. I mean, I do, I do think... <laughs> um, I've, I've, well, I certainly have faith in nature, but I also have faith in people. I think, you know, I think we are turning things around. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean to go back to the, to, the, to the earlier points you made, which I had never really thought about, forests cool things down. So in mm. the Amazon you cut down a forest and the, 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 the farmland that results, yeah. it gets much, much hotter, sometimes four or five degrees hotter. But you go to Siberia, the vast forests are actually warming things up. So w w w how does that work? And is there a balance at work? All forests have a kind of like competing effect. Um, that's true. Um, I mean, there are parts of the Amazon which are, which are genuinely scary. I mean, I went to basically the boundary between the huge expanse of soy farms and rainforest uh, controlled by indigenous communities. Um, I went to the farm and we went around because there's some research being done there. And yeah, the difference between the temperature in the forest, in, and out, in the forest and outside the forest is four or five degrees. Yeah. Um, but that also has an effect on the rainfall. So what people are really worried about there is what they call savannization. In other words, you chop down a forest, you change the local climate along the boundary, in that sort of boundary zone, and trees are less able to survive. Certainly rainforest trees are less able to survive. So the rainforest retreats, and you get a more sort of takeover of savanna, grass, grassy woodland kind of thing as a natural ecosystem. So there are real concerns there. Um, but... Um, so we've got to look out for those tipping points. So, I mean, I, may, I am being optimistic, mm. but, the, but there are real tipping points out there which, which could change things quite dramatically, certainly for rainforests. Up in the Siberia, yeah, uh, so the forests, um, uh, well, they keep things cool, but they have what they call the albedo effect, scientists would call the albedo, which are reflective surfaces. Um, if you think about it, if you, a forest has a very dark canopy, and that absorbs heat. Um, but if you, if next door to it is snow cover, is, as in northern Siberia it would be, so we're talking about the Arctic regions. Um, if you plant a forest, the people are talking about planting forests to uh, mitigate climate change. Mm. Um, if you plant a forest, you're creating this white surface which reflects back most of the solar radiation that comes down. You're replacing it with a dark surface which absorbs it and heats the air around it. So you can have the weird effect that while more forests in the Amazon, say, or anywhere in the tropics, will cool the planet, hmm. in Siberia, more trees might, um, might have the opposite effect. Hmm might actually warm the planet just by catching more of this radiation. Now, that's not saying we, you know, we should get rid of all the forests in <laughs> Siberia. I'm not saying that. Um, but we have to kind of be mindful of these kind of things. And it's um, one of the reasons why I do kind of science reporting is, is just to find out truths like that, um, exactly how the real world works. Exactly. So it's the interconnectedness of things. I mean, one of, for me, one of the other revelations of the book was that the rain in China is not a result of the Pacific Ocean. It's from... Kazakhstan and, and, and even Europe, is that correct? Yeah, they say, the, the numbers are not very clear because people can't, it's hard to work this out in, in detail, but there is, there is an argument, and there are the two Russian scientists that I, that I showed who showed in quite detail, good detail how forests, by stirring up the air and by the forest breath, essentially, maintain winds. So you've got winds coming in. We all know about sea breezes. Winds come in off the oceans onto the land because uh, the land is, is often warmer. And the hot air rises and the air warp comes in. Mm. Um, I don't know if 
I learned that in geography O level, maybe some of you did too. Um, but what happens in land? And the answer is that in land, if there are no trees, the winds die down and it gets dry because there's no moisture in the air um, and the winds stop. If there are forests in the coastal area and going inland, then not only do you get more moisture in the air because the winds going over the forest are getting, getting uh, are re-wetted, you know, they rain and the water goes back into the air and you get rain further inland. But that process also creates winds. So, and that can happen over huge areas. So as you say, in China, a lot of the wind and a lot of the rain that irrigates the crops for the world's most populous country and its breadbasket is in northern China, mm. comes as a result of forests that survive in Europe and which are in, in Siberia and, and through. So the wind, the moist wind, goes right across Asia. Um, and without the forests, it might not. Without the forests, uh, you know, northern China might look like the Sahara. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that, that also will mean yeah. China will have to, cognizant of that, pay attention to its relations with the rest of the world. I'd say so. Yeah. I mean, I, there's not much evidence that the geopolitics of that is playing out yet. But I certainly, <laughs> I certainly think it should. And the same is true, for instance, of the River Nile. Now, the River Nile gets most of its rainfall from the Horn of Africa, essentially. And most of the rainfall in the Horn of Africa is generated by forests in the Congo. So you get winds come in. You know, there are complicated maps that people do of, of, of where, it, where it goes. But essentially, that's right. So if you chop down the forests of the Congo, um, then the Nile dries up, put it very simply. So they're really, you know, mm. really big mm. issues mm. Um, that people, and, I mean, scientists are starting to talk about, and they, you know, I've been to UN meetings where people are starting to discuss these things, but it's a long way from actual real politics. But maybe later in the century it won't be. Yeah. I mean, I mean one thing that I, I mean, I've also been to, to Borneo and seen these huge palm oil plantations. Mm which have replaced the forest, and now you said, worryingly, it's most of Sarawak. But mm. aren't palm oil palm trees trees? Are they, why, are they, why is it worse? Is it because it's just a monoculture, or why? Well, but, I mean, yeah, it depends what you're thinking about. I mean, certainly in terms of biodiversity and wildlife and things. I mean, you, you, get, you, you will get some, you know, you'll get some orangutan. If you, I mean, I've seen some interesting research recently, that if you have forests near palm oil plantations, if you have a certain number of forests, you'll still have orangutans around. And they'll actually, they'll actually live in the forest and they'll come into the palm oil because they quite like the fruit. Um, so you, you, you don't have to have a completely um, sort of pristine looking landscape mm. in order mm. to keep wildlife, but you'll undoubtedly lose wildlife. Um, palm trees or palm oil plants do transpire a certain amount of moisture into the air so you don't lose it all. Mm. Um, all the rainfall downwind, but you lose quite a lot because they're not, they really aren't like a, ra a rainforest. Right. And what about their VOCs? Are they different, substantially different? Or? Uh, yeah, forests. I mean, there's a lot more vegetation in the forest. So VOCs, these uh, volatile organic compounds that are, um, uh, the, the chemistry of them is frighteningly complex and I don't really understand. Um, but the guys who built that, the Eiffel Tower outside Manaus in the Amazon were atmospheric chemists mm. determined to try and piece apart what was going on. Some of these compounds only last for a few seconds. They sort of come out of the forest, they interact with, interact with moisture coming out of the forest, and then they turn into something else. Um, but are they important while they're there? Or, you know, what? They're still working on that, to be honest. And, they, and you mentioned those, those have a, an important part to play in in cloud formation? Yeah, um, because, I mean, clouds, well, it, yes, to get water droplets in clouds, I mean, this is atmospheric science, really, but, I mean, to get water droplets in you have to have, like, a nucleus mm. for it, if you like, and that can be dust particle, um, or it can be, uh, over the oceans, it could be, be bits of sea salt, a kind of, you know, small particles will do it. But over rainforests, it's usually these compounds coming off, off the forest. So the danger is that without the forests, you lose those uh, cloud condensation nuclei, they, talk, they mm. call them in the jargon. Um, you lose those, and you will have 
less cloud. And if you have less moisture, because the forests aren't chucking the, you know, the liters of water into the air every day from each tree, and you don't have those nuclei to form, water, to form cloud droplets, um, downwind gets a lot drier. Mm. I, mean, it's an amazing, I mean, look at the comparison between the Sahara. I mean, the wind comes off the ocean, off West Africa, and goes into the Sahara, and pretty soon it's dry. It rains out in the coastal areas what moisture is picked up from the ocean, and it doesn't get any more moisture back. So the wind dries out, and the rainfall levels go down and down and down. As soon as you've got a desert. Over the Amazon, which on the face of it is quite similar, wind's coming off the ocean. But there, there's forest. Um, and so the moisture falls onto the forest. The forests push it back up again. Um, so the winds stay wet. Mm and they move further inland, and they rain again, and, it go, and the rainforest... The thing about rainforests is that they, not just do they, they don't just need rain, they also provide rain. Mm. So you go further inland, and actually over the Amazon, if you track it, it gets wetter further inland. It's amazing. Whereas the Sahara just immediately gets dry. And that's an effect of forests. Mm. It really mm. is. Well, it seems to me, from reading the book, that forests have... I mean, if they, have, if they are have this part to play in creating clouds. Clouds are key to climate change because, you, you, mm. you know, the, the more clouds you have, that will control how hot it gets. Yeah. Um, I mean, clouds... Yes, clouds are one of the things that climate scientists don't like to talk about because yeah. they, they find it very difficult to work out exactly what's going on. But essentially, I mean, it, it's true that at night clouds will tend to keep things um, warm, but in the day they keep things cool just by shade. Um, so they're, yeah, they're critical, and generally speaking, clouds keep things cool, yeah. both locally and, 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 and globally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could, I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, I love the detail of these things, and... I get, I, yeah, I, I get kind of tied up in the details sometimes, yeah. but I hope not too much in the no, book, no, I, but I, it I, does intrigue I, me. I love those details, and I, I, I also like um, some, some of the sort of telling statistics, perhaps... Uh, uh, I mean, not always supported by masses of, of research, but the, the fact that, I think it was the University of Maryland a few years ago said, only three years ago, that we've got 7% more forest than 40 years ago. Yeah. Now, I mean, not all of that is what you'd call natural forest. Some of it is plantation, for sure. But there is actually more natural forest as well. Um, we're still losing forests in the, in, in the tropics. I mean, despite places like Costa Rica, we're still losing forests for sure. Yeah. No question. Yeah. But in many other parts of the world, we're gaining forests. So in Europe, forest land, uh, uh, farmland is being abandoned. North America, too, quite large areas of farmland being abandoned. You go to the American South and lots of old cotton fields are now forest. Um, and also in the far north, where it's getting warmer, the forests are tending to push further north. Um, so, and it's also true um, that on farms, farmers are planting or encouraging or just allowing to grow more trees because they find that they provide crops, you know, they provide fruit and things that they can sell in local markets or wood or, you know, they'll, sometimes they'll bring in, in guys with chainsaws to cut down and they'll do a deal about who gets how much money. For, you know, for, trees are quite valuable on a farm mm. and they can be a genuine crop in their own. But they also are very good for the other crops because, as I said in the uh, story in the Sahel, they generally will create better soil. So you need less fertilizer for a start. Mm. Um, very often they ward off um, pests. Uh, there's sort of natural, um, natural resistance to pests on landscapes with lots of trees is generally better. Good mm. research on that as well. Mm. Um, and farmers kind of know this. Um, I mean, they were taught for a long time by agricultural scientists. I don't want to do a downer on agricultural scientists. We probably might have one or two <laughs> in the room. But for a long time, there was a presumption that it was best to clear bush or weeds or trees or roots or whatever it was from the, from the ground and the soil before you plant them, before you plant it. Um, 
But that's changing quite a lot now, and there's a sort of different perception that trees can be a useful part of a productive landscape. So, I mean, the, the, the bottom line, there's, there's a research agency called the World Agro, Agroforestry um, Institute, and they've, uh, uh, they reckon that there are now, you know, several percent more trees on farmland than they used to be. Mm -hmm. So this idea that it's farms versus forests mm, is a bit, is a bit false. Mm. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you've got some questions, so I will, you know, stop hogging uh, Fred. And uh, are there any questions that you'd like to ask him? Over there. These are our socially distanced microphones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk. That was fascinating. I've Thanks. always loved woods and forests in this country and in Scandinavia. Um, and I can recall as a child being distressed when they cut down some seemingly perfectly all right beech trees that I used to climb. Mm. Um, recently, I contacted our local council, Dumfries and Galloway, because I felt that we should be planting trees mm. in areas of our towns, etc. And in the past, I've um, actually, behind my house, they built an estate, and on the plans, they, each house was supposed to have a tree in the garden. Well, it didn't happen, just two or three had it. And according to the man at the council, uh, well, you can't go back and tell people to plant trees in their garden, even though they were planned for. Mm. Personally, I have cut a tree down, but I've also replaced it with what I consider a better type of tree. Um, and I have a lot of trees in my garden, but I would like to see in the local area an initiative, I live in Newton Stewart, where we plant on, you know, pieces of ground. I mean, we have a terrible example in Newton Stewart where a developer cut down some mature oak trees, really lovely ones, mm. and then he never built the houses. Mm. Okay. And when is I there a question? Is there a question in there? Yeah, a there is a, a question. Here. How do we, at a local level, because you're talking about people, you know, in their forests and that planting, how mm. do we, at our little local level, try to, you know, carry that forward? Uh, probably making a lot of noise and creating a lot of fuss so that it's not um, everybody, will, every, anybody who wants to chop down a tree will have to think, you know, several times about it. Not only they, but, but you know, the local authorities, um, uh, local councils are going to think very hard before allowing it and are going um, to crack down if people do it. One of the problems is once a tree's cut down, you know, it's cut down and that's, you can't kind of put it back in the way that you put but, um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't have a simple answer. I think it's just, we just have to make a lot of fuss um, about protecting the trees that we have, abs absolutely, and for finding ways for nurturing trees. You know, I mean, even, I mean, I, you know, I live in London, uh, and there's a lot of wasteland where, where trees could be restored in London. And we already have quite a lot of trees, to be honest, but um, there's an awful lot that we can do. And I think... Um, you know, if people are talking locally about trees, people have a strong relationship with trees. You know, we feel it about trees. We want trees. We appreciate woodland. So uh, sort of campaigning and making a fuss about it locally um, is likely to be on fertile ground. I mean, there will be, you know, there will be support. Um, I don't think there's an easy way to do it. I mean, you know the way that democratic systems and undemocratic systems work is, is, can be complicated and perverse, but you just have to make a lot of noise, I think. Um, and, you know, set, set a good example when you can and, and encourage people who've got land to set a good example. And when they do it, uh, applaud them for it, because, pe you know, people like to be applauded for doing the right thing or even just not doing the wrong thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, stir it up. Sounds like you already are. <laughs> okay. Can I just um, ask a question, which is an important one, and it's a word that we've been using, you've used, we've used many times over, and that is the word trillion. Mm. How many is a trillion? In the old days, a billion <laughs> used to be a thousand million, and it used to be a million million. Now yeah. a trillion is a thousand million. Yeah, so I, I, yeah. Okay. We do need to know that. My apologies. Uh, a trillion for me is a million million. So for me, a billion is a thousand million. Um, 
and a trillion is a thousand billion. So that's a million million. Um, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot, almost um, incomprehensibly. As, as, I, as I said, a, a trillion trees in 30 years requires a thousand trees every second throughout that 30 years. Maybe that's a way of thinking about it. Uh, but I, 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 I take what you say, I, I, I stand corrected, but that's, that's, that's the form that I'm using. It's, it's, America, it's American, I'm afraid, but it has taken over. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, is there a question down there at the back? I wondered if you would like to comment uh, mm. on the global timber trade, and both in timber and in nursery trees, and the impact this is having on tree disease. Why I'm, one of the reasons I'm saying this is there's very obvious threat in this area from ash dieback. Mm. Ash is a very important element uh, of any semi-natural woodland we have. We've already suffered this in the tree crops of larch. But uh, I don't know whether people are aware of it, but the ash problem here is now mm. very obvious and is going to have a very big impact on our local wood. Tree diseases, yeah, yeah. interesting. I mean, I mean the, 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 simple, the simple answer, I suppose, is, is that if we're doing planting, and if we're doing planting with either uh, non-native species or just um, trees, saplings that we brought in from a from elsewhere, then there is always a danger of spreading diseases. Um, and if you have monocultures or very large numbers of the same species of a tree in one area, it can, same as in an agricultural crop, it can just run through really very quickly. So I think the, the obvious, I mean, obviously, you know, hygiene, Forestry hygiene is, is important and, and just making sure that you don't import diseases or reduce the chances of importing diseases, that's obviously important. But I think the way we run forests um, can reduce the risks quite a lot. So having biodiverse woodlands without a predominance of one tree, natural style forests, even if they're not totally natural, we may be planting them or we're not. And probably, you know, the most, it's dangerous to generalize, but the, probably the most resilient trees will be, forests will, and woodlands will be those with, uh, with a wide range of uh, natural, locally indigenous species. Now, that's not a panacea, it doesn't, it's not always true, but it's probably the best bet. That's my gut feeling, anyway. I mean, I should say, I mean, I'm not a forester, I can count to a trillion, um, and I know about the politics of trees and the geography of trees and sometimes about the climate of trees, but I'm not a forester and I wouldn't take what I say as the last word on anything botanical in relation to trees. But, um, I mean, we're talking about disease. It's often the disease trees that catch fire. We, we didn't really... You touch on that in the book. Yeah. Forest fires, that's captured the news. But how, how, how important is that? Because we know that in the past, forests needed fire. Yeah, for, that's, that's an important issue. Yes, many, many trees, um, many tree species require forests to reproduce. Um, they require forests to sort of um, break up the nuts or whatever it is. I mean, they have different mechanisms for fire to create the right soils for, um, for trees to grow, fire to create clearings so that there's light coming into the forest um, for trees to grow. And again, it's, it varies, and different trees have, have different life cycles. But in many parts of it, so for instance, the, the big Australian fires of a mm. couple of years ago, um, as many people pointed out, fire is necessary to those um, ecosystems. But too much fire can, can be devastating. Now, probably the forest will come back eventually, mm. but the short-term effects are, are pretty devastating. Um, so we all have... I mean, there's a lot of debate about uh, setting fires to protect against fires. So since most, uh, you know, forest, uh, fires will run through most forests at some point or another. Um, some of the worst problems that we have, and it's undoubtedly getting worse because of climate change, and it's true in large areas of the world, but some of the worst problems that we have are because we protect against all fires. Mm. 
zero fire strategy, if you like, put out all fires, because what fires are bad? That was, again, a sort of 20th century view, if you like. Um, and the problem with that is you get a build-up of so much um, stuff on the ground that if you do get a fire, whoosh, it just goes through, and you get a much more intense fire. It's a hotter fire. It's a fire which goes much higher. Um, so you get different kinds of fires. So a lot of fire strategies now, um, I looked at this in the US, and I suspect it's similarly true in Europe, a lot of fire protection strategies now involve using fire. Typically, early in the season, you know, not when it's all bone dry, mm. but um, perhaps towards the end of a, of a wet season, you'll set local fires to reduce the undergrowth. Um, so, you know, if you've got a managed forest, basically you've got to manage it. You can't always just let it go. So you, you set fires to reduce the chance of the big fire. Mm. Um, and that all changed. I mean, there was a big sea change after, I think it was the Yellowstone fires. I've got 20 years in Yellowstone National Park in the US. And foresters, I think, more or less all over the world sort of had to rethink about their attitude to fire. So, you know, I mean, these things do get complicated because, you know, we are in a relationship with trees and forests and we can't completely stand back and let everything rip much as I'd like to. Um, we have to, you know, kind of monitor carefully and, and come up with practical strategies, mm. especially in, I mean, especially in productive forests, mm. ones that we're using, ones that we planted, ones that are uh, the least natural, if you like. Mm. Any more? At what stage in its life does a tree maximize carbon sequestration? Early. Um, if you want to mount, uh, look at the amount of carbon that a tree is capturing, it's probably... Uh, it varies with the tree, of course, but in its first sort of decade or so, I would guess, generally. Um, and then it begins to tail off. Uh, I would... The thinking then might be, well, what do we need to do? You know, let's get rid of the old trees and plant some new ones because they'll soak up more carbon. Um, but what we actually... If we're talking about climate, which I think we, in this context we will be, what we want is for the world's forests to, if you like, hold as much carbon as they can. Or all ecosystems, wetlands and others, but forests are the big ones, I guess. Um, and to do that, you will get most carbon held in a mature forest. So there's what some people talk about, it's a stock and flow problem, if, uh, you know, it's sort of language of economists and people, but you can have high carbon sequestration, but if, if you're not actually holding, you, you know, it's, it's kind of transient. Uh, some people want to plant fast-growing trees to soak up lots of carbon. They say, look, the first 10 years, first 20 years, first 30 years, look, all this carbon has been soaked up, taken all this carbon out of the atmosphere. We then have to ask what happens to those trees. Do we turn them into paper and put all the carbon back up? Um, what happened to the soils? Because in... Um, Many forests, probably most forests, most of the carbon is in the soils. So if, you're, if, if, if you are managing a forest in a very sort of kind of productive way in terms of timber, you may be having a bad effect on the soils. Not universally, but you may well be. Um, so there are, Sorry, I, I, I hope I've answered your question, but there's quite a lot kind of tied up in it in terms of what lessons you draw from it. And the lesson I draw is... Um, that older forests may not be taking much carbon out of the atmosphere anymore, but they're holding a hell of a lot. Um, and that, for the sort of long run, climate change is something where we should be thinking about what happens 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. Uh, that's what, to me, matters at any rate. Interesting. I think we've got time for one more question because oh, uh, we've got long running. Okay, over there. Hello. Uh, yes, a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a, a regenerative farmer, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we've planted a lot of trees on our farm over the last 20 years. 
Um, mixed broad leaves, about 35,000 of them. So um, going from cutting them all down to planting them has been quite a transformation. Uh, a fascinating aspect of uh, trees um, <clears throat> for me is that uh, as we transition globally from um, tree-covered planet to um, right through all the transitions, woodlands, um, crops, savannas, and uh, semi-desert, desert. Uh, each transition uh, results in uh, additional um, emissions of long-wave uh, energy reflected from, not reflected, it's radiated, re-radiated from the uh, into the atmosphere. And that type of energy is the energy that is trapped by the greenhouse gases. Um, and have you looked into the implications of the degradation of the ecology of the world and the impact that, that has in terms of adding energy to the atmosphere and its contribution to climate change? Because I've looked into the IPCC reports and other uh, climate change reports and I cannot find any reference to the impact of re-radiated long wave energy from degraded, degraded soils. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think a question, I mean, it, 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 it's complicated because the energy happens in different forms. The energy can happen to do with the recycling of moisture into the atmosphere, which has an effect on, on temperatures in the air. That's an energy effect. The albedo effect that I talked about, the reflectivity of forest canopies um, has an effect. Um, all these things can influence on local climate conditions, which additionally have energy effects. Um, so I don't, I don't think, I, I mean, there is research into it. I don't think I have a sort of general answer to, um, to that. I think forests are, if you like, a, a natural part of the cycling of resources, of, of energy cycling, of water cycling, of carbon cycling, of other sort of key constituents of, what, of, of how the planet works, of its kind of life support systems. So I think we meddle with them um, at our peril, if you like. Um, so um, I don't know. Um, I, I rather think my gut feeling is that while we're learning, um, putting some trees back will be a good idea. <laughs> if, if I can put it that simply. <laughs> My, my, that's my sort of default position. Yeah. But thank you for the question. Yeah. Well, I think um, you could probably go on longer, but I uh, absolutely fascinating uh, talk. Thank you. And lots of new ideas. And I think the the the, the takeaway of of optimism and and trusting ourselves, trusting communities, um, trusting nature is is a, a, a great one to be able to take away. So. Thank you. Thank you and, very much. For and it. be optimistic. And be optimistic. Please. Thank you. <laughs>